Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Hello. Welcome to the Starco Planetarium. We're so glad you could join us here this evening. Um, as you may or may not know, on the first Friday of the month throughout the school year, we invite people to come in, uh, people who uh, study science, to come in and talk about their research or talk about their area of expertise. Uh, this is a series that used to be called the World of Science Lecture Series, uh, but we named it after one of our very frequent speakers, Jim Kaler. So now it's the James B. Kaler Science Lecture Series. Um, we're always happy to uh, have actually um, some Parkland College students coming in to give talks about their research. We've done that for the last several years uh, with the PREX program. If you'd like to learn more about the PREX program, we are going to share that with you this evening. Um, we have our co-PIs here, is that correct, co-PIs? Yes, oof, glad I remember that off the top of my head. Our co-principal um, co, uh, investigators, is that the word? Yes. Our co-principal investigators are here. Uh, one of them uh, is one of our Parkland College faculty here, Dr. Britt Carlson. She is going to introduce that program and introduce our three speakers who will talk about what they did over the summer. So um, we thank you all for um, helping support that program and we encourage you folks to ask many questions about their research because they prepared for this, okay? I promise you that, all right? Um, so for this talk, I'm actually gonna be operating the camera so you're not gonna see a whole lot of me during this. I'm gonna hand the microphone off to Britt and she will tell you more about the program and about those speakers, all right? So Dr. Carlson, come on up. All right, can everybody hear me okay? All right, thank you for coming. Um, yes, so I am the co-PI of the PREX program, which you can see this great flyer that Parkland made for us. This is our cohort from the summer 2022, so we've got three of our um, Parkland participants are gonna be talking tonight. Uh, my, the PI, my partner on the program is over here, Nate Schroeder, and he is a University of Illinois faculty, so this is a Parkland University of Illinois collaboration. Um, all right, so PREX. PREX is the program that I'm, I'm here to talk about today, or the host for these three students. Um, it stands for Phenotypic Plasticity Research Experience for Community College Students. So we are open to community college students across the country, uh, and they come and they start at Parkland at the beginning of the program, and then they transition to being embedded in different labs at the University of Illinois. Um, this is our website if you want to check us out. There's also tons of information all over the science commons in the L-Wing here at Parkland because, yeah, that's what I do. I put all the flyers up. Um, so what is phenotypic plasticity? So this is where you would have an organism will have one set of DNA, right? This is their genes, their genetic material. However, the organism lives in different environments. So how is that organism responding to the environment? So um, that's, the, oh, that's the plasticity part here. So it's talking about change, right? It's adjustable or it's going to be um, reflecting changes in the environment. So we could be talking about behavioral changes. We could be looking at differences in cell shape or size, um, all sorts of different types of changes. So the example that I have here with the plant would be something like you have a plant and if you have a high CO2 environment, the plant is gonna need more of these specialized structures, these cells called stomata, which uh, allow for gas exchange, right? So we know that plants will use CO2 and then can create energy sources out of that. So if there's a lot of CO2, they don't need a lot of those cells that allow the CO2 into the plant. However, if you're in a low carbon dioxide environment, you're gonna need more of those so that you can try to capture as much of that that's in the environment as possible. So you can kind of switch on um, the genes that say, hey, let's make more of this cell type than another cell type. This is just one example. Like I said, it can be all sorts of different types and you're gonna see that with our speaker today. They're very diverse projects. So we've got our three speakers and we're gonna go in this order. Um, Sarah and then Sarah and then Stephanie and they're here doing their work on the side. We've arranged this so that after each student 
gives their presentation, there'll be a short amount of time for questions for that speaker, um, but not too much because we want to have time for the next speaker and so on. And then we'll have a question to answer time at the very end of the entire presentation where all the speakers, including me, will come up here so you could ask any questions about any of the different um, projects and also about the program in general. And one last thing I'm going to mention before I hand this over to Sarah is that um, I have some information as you're heading out about what is undergraduate research, what does it look like, how do you get into them, so you'll be learning more about that today, but if you want some kind of tips and tricks. And also, for those of you guys who are at Parkland, we're having a research fair on Thursday, this coming Thursday, from 12 to 12.50 at the bottom of the library stairs. So you can come talk to people more one-on-one -on -one at that time, if you're available. So I've got some flyers about that. All right, so with that, I am going to hand everything over to Sarah, our first speaker. Okay, so my name is Sarah Kroenke, and this summer I spent my time in the lab at the U of I um, working with amaranth and um, all of the unique qualities of that species. So what I would like to do is go over a little bit about what I did, why I did it, how I did it, and um, like the next steps to take with my project and um, everything that I did this summer. So what I was doing was using um, UV vis spectroscopy in order to quantify levels of chlorophylls A, B, and carotenoids in my different amaranth samples. Um, this was supposed to be able to provide base level data to add to several projects that are going on in the Riggins lab this, um, well right now actually, yeah. Um, and that pigment data would actually um, give us an idea of what is happi happening within the plants chemically. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it, but they have, some have developed herbicide resistance, um, different stress tolerance coping mechanisms, and then the ways that we um, apply it as a natural food colorant. Okay, so um, why are we studying amaranth? Uh, amaranth is actually a really, really diverse um, plant type, and there's over 74 species around the world. Um, so that includes some of our very nutritious yet underlized, um, you know, food crops. So um, if you would just draw your attention about like right here. So this is one of our very pretty, very ornamental amaranths. Uh, it's the tricolor, but it's also a leafy vegetable. So great for having out on your porch to look nice. But then if you want to give a little razzle dazzle to your salad that day, tricolor is definitely one of the types for you. And then it actually has several different um, kinds of the tricolor. Um, we also have some that are really just look at the flowers on that. That's amazing. The inflorescence actually is what it's called. Um, but it's beautiful. But another thing about that type and that is the hypochondriacus, I do believe. And um, that is actually a pseudo grain. Fun fact, pseudo grains are like other grains except they didn't come from a grass like plant. So um, it does allow grains for all of those seeds. And then I would also like to draw your attention right here. This is a Palmer amaranth. So this is actually a huge pest in the agricultural world. It is causing issues all over the place. Um, and when I was talking about that um, herbicide resistance, this is really the culprit right here. Um, I would like to note the color of this is green. So remember that the Palmer amaranth is green because we're going to touch on that later on and see why that's really relevant. So um, some more interesting facts about amaranth actually um, are that we're studying the the betalins and the carotenoids. So betalins are actually really really interesting because they are unique to um, just two different types of orders actually so there's one order in the plant family and one order in the fungi or in the fungi order um, 
that um, actually utilize betalins and the betalins are giving that rich red color and they give off a little bit of yellow too. So um, that is the type of pigmentation that amaranth has for that red. Um, again, it is very, very unique. And then I was studying carotenoids. Does anyone want to guess what carotenoid color is? What? Yep, we get our orange, yellows, and some red. So um, you look at this guy that's got some carotenoids that you can see and right here too. Um, so that is what I was actually studying was the chlorophylls and the carotenoids. I was studying those oranges. Okay, so um, what I was doing. So I, we took some freeze dried samples as you can see right here. It's really like a fine powder. Interesting fact about that. Um, so we would take samples and then freeze them and then we would actually have to sublimate them in order to get this um, lyophilized um, product right here. Um, so the sublimation process is where you actually combine enough like pressure and temperature so that way it goes though all of the water content in my sample went from being frozen to directly um, a gas. So it didn't go through that liquid phase which means I did not end up with like a soggy sample material to work with. So that was good. Um, after that, we would just put it in some 95% um, ethanol for 24 hours and then take it out, put it in the centrifuge. So the centrifuge, it's really just a really fast spinning process pretty much. Um, and once that was finished, these right here, we'd have our supernatant, which is all that green. So you can see all of our chlorophyll for sure. Um, but then the, it, we would have like a little pellet of the lyophilized um, powder would be all at the bottom. So that way I can just extract the green supernatant there. And then that's when I would run it through the UV Viz. Um, I would be reading at um, the six, oh, excuse me, 470, 649 and um, what is it, 664 nanometers. And then after that, I would apply um, the beer, beer Lambert's Law, so that way I would understand by the absorbance that I was getting, um, I could turn that into like a, like a, a concentration, like how much uh, chlorophyll and how much carotenoid is in my sample. So that was perfect. Okay, so remember how I told you to take note that the Palmer amaranth is, is green, right? It was a very green plant. Would we expect a lot of carotenoids in a green plant? I mean, you'd expect some, as you can see, they all have some. But like I said, the hy hypochondriacus and uh, the Corinthus, these are some ornamentals. Very, very orange, yellow, deep reds. But our Palmer amaranth is green, and it actually has quite a bit of carotenoid content. So what makes carotenoid special? Drop back in. Why was I studying that? Well, we're wondering if that has anything to do with the like herbicide resistance in some of these Palmer amaranths. Um, is that one of their coping mechanisms? So why is that herbicide resistance a big, huge, hairy deal? Well, you saw the inflorescence on like those really pretty ones. Well, the Palmer amaranth can get an inflorescence that is very similar and it can drop up to a million seeds. So I'm sure that you can imagine the problem if you have a plant that cannot be killed by Roundup in a field that can drop a million seeds. You can have a, com a farm completely decimated um, just within a few years. So it can be very, very problematic. So um, I did put a lot of my weedier amaranths over here so you can see those carotenoid contents. Now not all of these are actually um, herbicide resistant. Uh, the Palmer amaranth is the one that is adapted to do that. Um, but then I put my more ornamentals over here. So just so you could see a kind of difference. However, when looking at this graph, we also have to understand that um, with my assay, there were a lot of caveats. Um, so for example, my, a lot of my samples were freeze dried. However, some were fresh frozen. So with more water content, that's going to give more of a skewed idea of um, you know, like how much carotenoids are in there. Uh, some of my samples were also strictly just leaf tissues versus above ground biomass, so the whole plant. And obviously leaf tissues are gonna be more concentrated versus a, um, a sample that includes like stems and everything else. So um, what we learned, the UV Viz um, spectroscopy, that is a great like preliminary screening tool that worked out really well, bless you. Um, 
I was able to provide some new data for previous, current, and ongoing projects in the Riggins lab. Um, so it was really, really great to be able to tie in a lot of those projects. Um, and then the phytochemical pieces to the puzzle of mechanisms. So really it's just um, one more step towards understanding how these plants are adapting. And um, then we are going to, oh, biscuits. Okay, so then um, we can use an HPLC, which is a high performance liquid chromatography um, in order to study these more. So I talked about um, carotenoids, but there are di many different types of carotenoids, uh, beta carotenes, lutenes. Um, there's several of them. Um, right now we are actually working with beta carotene. Um, and so you can use the high performance liquid chromatographer um, to kind of isolate the beta carotene in a sample. So if you have a sample and you're not sure if it even has it in there, um, you can use that to kind of see um, the specific peaks where you would expect to find the beta carotene um, once you are analyzing that data. Um, which was really, really cool because my data also would offer um, what percentage, you know, once we had the whole carotenoid um, content, then you could take the, how much of that is beta carotene once you run the samples through. So I would like to finish by saying thank you so much to the National Science Foundation, to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Parkland College, um, and my co-PIs, Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Carlson. I would also like to thank um, my lab PI, um, Dr. Riggins, and my um, grad students working in the lab, Crystal Vargas and uh, James Woods, and then also, um, there was another student that actually provided some of my preliminary data and information as well, but it looks like I forgot to list him. Oh, nope, Jay Howard, there he is right there, Jay Howard. I never got to meet him, but I did learn a lot from him and he doesn't even know it, so. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any questions for me? We have a question in there. Hi. Um, so you had said your samples were some were freeze dried, some were the whole plant, some were just leaves. So when you were doing your experience, how do you normalize for that type of variance or does it not really matter in what you were doing? That is a great question. So actually each sample um, set, so um, there are several projects going on in the lab and I'm pretty, like I'm working with them. So they had a specific way that they prepared their sample. So I would run their assay f um, under the UV vis for them. So they would have, um, here, let me go back real quick. So as you can see, like there's several cruentists, right? Um, some of those are the same, type of sample, but they have been prepared differently, if that makes sense, for their specific project. Um, so each time I ran an assay, I would know which type it was, like how it was prepared. Um, so that way I could provide data for their personal project, and then I would do it for you know the next project and so on and such forth. So all of their samples for each project were prepared the same, but I was just screening all of them. So I separated it by project in order to keep it all straight. Uh-huh. So how does it taste on salad? <laughs> it's actually kind of spinachy. It's like spinach, yeah. So the question was, how does it taste? Just for the sake of the video. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions for Sarah? Oh. Do you have any idea how the carotenoids provide protection from the Roundup and herbicides and things like that? No, so it's not actually confirmed. It's just a sneaking suspicion at this point. And so they are working to collect more data about it. Um, that is, we're still trying to understand that coping mechanism. And once we do understand that coping mechanism, I'm sure you can imagine how that could be applied towards plants that we do like, you know? So they have Roundup Ready corn. Um, maybe we can apply it to um, plants that are not monocots. I don't know if that's the hiccup there. Um, so maybe getting our soybeans and everything too, um, or just any other leafy vegetables and everything. So still trying to understand how and why. Um, okay, this is on. 
So the uh, hypochondriacus. Yes, that sounds, okay, this is going to be a silly question. That sounds an awfully lot like hypochondriac. Any, do you know like why that is called what it's called? I could see a field of those looking kind of like a fire. I don't know that that's for sure, but I don't know why it's called hypochondriacus actually. But, um, and I think I might have miscon, like I might have confused the word. Nope, no idea. That is beyond the scope of my project. <laughs> <laughs> but I will have to look into it. <laughs> okay, let's thank Sarah for her presentation. <laughs> and we are going to pass the mic off to next Sarah. Also a great Sarah. <laughs> Um, and again, if you guys do have questions that come up later, we'll kind of do a panel of questions at the end. So hold on to those. Hello, my name is Sarah Porth. Uh, this summer, I had the pleasure of working in the Fisher Lab at the U of I, and we work with um, different kinds of frogs. And so um, we, I worked on tadpoles of these three different species. Um, with Dr. Ava Fisher and my uh, mentor, Lisa Serber. All right, so what we did was work on um, the lateral line of tadpoles. Um, in aquatic animals, um, instead of having a five senses like we do, they actually, they use what is called the lateral line system. The lateral line system is made up of neuromass. Um, it's found in fishes, larval amphibians, and aquatic adult amphibians. Um, the line is in this picture. So this is a picture of a zebra fish. Um, and you can see right here, these little lines that are uh, lit up right along here. Um, and here, All, each individual dot is known as a neuromast. And so this is a little close up of the neuromast because this is what we're looking for. Um, the neuromass um, is made up of a cupula at the top, the cilia, which are really important, they're uh, hair-like fibers, the hair cell, and the nerve. So the nerve is what is going to give information to the fish. Um, so what this is doing, this is a scanning electron uh, microscope picture of the neuromass. So this is on the skin of the fish. Um, and what it's doing is taking water and it's when the water is moving about it is um, being able to tell the the animal where it is uh, what it's surrounded by uh, where its food might be so this is basically giving them a sense this is giving them a sense of where they're located and how they can survive in their environment Um, another thing that we decided to look at during our project, and I'll mention really quick, was the Gosner stage. Um, we did take some recordings of that when we were looking for the neural mass to see if that changed between Gosner stages. Um, so a Gosner stage basically is one of, um, there's I think about 46 different stages that a frog goes through from its eggs to its an adult size. And so we looked during development, we were mostly um, in this area. So we were, uh, we were looking at leg development and, and tail development while we were looking for the neuromass. So the species that I worked with, uh, we worked with two closely related poison fro dart frogs. Uh, we worked with Rainitmyo imitator and Dendrobates sinctoris. Uh, they're both from the same family, Dendrobatidae, and they're kind of similar. Um, the, the imitator is actually probably a third of the size of the Tinctorius, um, but they're, they have a lot of similarities. So for instance, um, the imitator, lay, they, um, they lay their tadpoles and the parent carries on their back to a small like, plant-like 
uh, like in a plant, it usually has like uh, water. Um, and so they'll, let, they'll bring their tadpole to this water in order for it to develop and grow. And when it's ready, it will climb out. So the tinctorius does the same thing, just in larger bodies of water. So they're gonna be in like lakes, small ponds. And a completely different frog that we looked at was the glass frog. Um, this is in a different family. Um, and they are actually a lot more tropical in areas of higher bodies of water. Um, lots more rainfall even than the uh, dart frogs are. Um, so we're comparing all three of these and seeing what their sensory systems are looking like in these very different environments. Um, so right here, um, the glass frog, so the way that they lay their tadpoles is actually on the underside of leaves. And so instead of like with the dart frogs who take their tadpoles from one location and drop them into a pond when they're ready, these these frogs actually rely on the water itself to pull their tadpoles down into a body of water. So once they lay their eggs, they're done. And so we want to see what the difference is in, in neuromass for these different environments. So we did have some predictions here. We predicted that the number of the neuromass would vary more between species from different evolutionary families than from, or would differ, so the glass frogs would be different, more different than the dart, poison dart frogs. So the two that are related are going to be, we predicted would have some mostly the same sensory systems. And then the glass frogs we predicted would maybe have a higher, um, higher amount of neuromass because they're in areas that are more aquatic. Um, methods, so we, our methods were really easy in this situation. Um, we got to take uh, the tadpoles and soak them for 30 minutes in a dye. Um, and this dye um, basically goes into the neuromass and it stains their mitochondria. And when it stains their mitochondria, then we can look at it under fluorescent microscopy. So um, basically, we put them in the dye for about 30 minutes, rinse them. We do have to anesthetize them because they do wiggle a lot. Um, so we anesthetize them, um, and then we can look at them. So right here um, is me working with the fluorescent microscope. Um, we have a tadpole under here. This is the top side. Um, and in our lab book, we just were recording um, right here where the, what Gosner stage each one was. So when we were under the microscope, we could see uh, the legs better and we could determine like which God, Gosner stage that they were actually at. So we kept track of that in the lab book. And then we got some really cool images. Um, what we determined, um, so from this later stage, this is a later Gosner stage, you can see the legs have developed here. Um, the imitator has these little dots kind of evenly spaced, and its family member over here kind of has the same thing going on too, evenly spaced dots over here. Now, the completely different glass frogs um, they actually have two lines. They have an extra line of neuromasts up top that the other two don't have. We also saw that they had double couplets of neuromasts and they were spaced closer together than the other two. And for our results, pretty much um, showed what we had guessed. Um, the glass frog is the green, is the green uh, box right here. Um, they have a higher density of neuromass compared to the poison frogs, and they had more. Um, so like I, we sh I showed you in the picture before, um, there was a very, uh, another line, an extra line with the glass frogs that the poison dart frogs just didn't have. Um, and that was a, an interesting find for us. So they have more neuromass, which means that they can, they can um, sense more in their environment than the dart frogs. 
And so what we have gathered from this, there was also some other, um, there's also other projects going on in the lab. We looked at um, startle response in tadpoles. Um, we noticed that the glass frogs have a higher startle response, so they get startled easier. And we're th putting things together like, um, so they, they respond to cues quicker in their environment than the dart frogs do. Well, is that because they have this extra line of neuromass up here helping them? Um, we also, um, in the lab, uh, we're working with parental behavior, um, and we could also see differences um, with the parents. Um, so these two, the parents are involved in the tadpole care. They really have to, the tadpoles are reliant on the parents in order to make it. The glass frogs are absolutely reliant on heavy rainfall and rivers and streams. So that's another reason why we're thinking that they have a lot more neuromass because it, their survival directly correlates with running water. They have to have that in order to survive. If it's too dry, they won't make it. So some future work that we're looking at in the lab to try to um, take this project even further. Um, we're going to, those pictures that I showed you were just the tail of the tadpoles, um, but we want to also look at the dorsal and ventral neural mass. Um, there was a lot of different patterns in each ones and we want to compare to see if there's different patterns, um, more or less. Um, and things like that. Um, we also did the Gosnar stage and at first it was kind of like an afterthought but we realized that it was kind of important in understanding the density of the neuromass and where they are during development. Um, so we might look at more later stage uh, tinctorious and glass frogs um, to, see, to see if there's changes. Um, and then, unfortunately, we did want to do a fourth one, but we weren't able to. So the future um, could be doing the Xenopus lavis tadpoles. That's actually um, the African clawed frog, which is a fully aquatic frog um, as an adult. And we were wondering what their tadpole uh, neuromass might look like um, because they don't ever climb out of the water. So are they, you know, potentially going to have more? Um, and then I talked about the startle behavior. Um, we did have some correlations between the data in this project and the startle response project uh, that we want to look further into as well. So for my acknowledgements, I'd like to thank um, the NSF for the financial support, um, the U of I, um, the PREX program, Dr. Carlson, Dr. Schroeder, uh, we'd also like to thank Lisa Server, uh, which was my mentor who helped me with this project, um, Dr. Ava Fisher, whose lab it was in, for having me, and uh, the Institute for Genomic Biology and Parkland College. Does anyone have any Okay. Is there more of an abundance of one of the frogs that you studied than the other, like um, more tadpoles or th with the environment, more survival of one type of a frog over another? So actually, um, we did find something interesting um, during this time. Um, well, there was a an issue where the glass frogs, tadpoles weren't like making it as as the dart frogs were. So we had a lot of dart frog tadpoles. And then when we revamped um, the, the uh, tanks for the glass frogs to have more water, they actually put running water in them. Um, and then so now that's when we see like this extreme boom of all of these glass frog tadpoles. So the water um, you know, correlation with them being able to survive, there's so many more now of them than the uh, than the dart frogs, um, and I'm wondering if it's because like you saw in the picture, um, they lay like a very big clutch of eggs, you know, like 20 or something, and whereas the dart frogs are only laying maybe like three to five at a time. 
um, you know, and they're responsible, the parents are, for getting them to the water. So I, di I did see a huge like increase in glass frogs while I was in the lab. Um, great presentation. Um, I just have a question, kind of like jumping up from the question that was asked earlier on. Um, in terms of like, is it, would you would you see any kind of like correlation between like let's say the number of tadpoles to the number of like um, the neuro what what's it again? The uh, neural mass. Neural mass. Yeah. Like in terms of like let's say if you have like a huge number of population, um, like maybe they're not, um, they'll be fighting for like some kind of resource so that environmental factor or something like that would affect how much neural mass they might have uh, or maybe if you have like a lesser population and yeah, there's not that like a lot of interaction they'll be like like I don't know if that's something that you're considering um, as yeah well. well a couple things that might be of interest to your question so during this um, another project in the lab um, was actually putting um, tadpole, the poison dart frog tadpoles together, kind of like in, a, we called it an arena, it was a bucket. Um, so we put them in the arena um, and see what they do to each other. Um, so we were, and this goes back to um, the poison dart frogs in the lab are each kept um, individually in containers in water. The glass frogs are all put into like one big one together and there, there's like I think up to like 40 or 50 at a time. Um, so the project with the dart frog tadpoles where they we put them in the arena, um, we did see sometimes that there was more aggressive behavior in ones that were kept alone versus like the glass frog tadpoles that are all kept together. They're all used to each other. Um, they don't actually really seem to fight over resources, um, whereas the the uh, dart frogs kind of their tadpoles seem to be that way and I'm wondering if it's because like they're fighting each other in like a pond versus a stream or um, you know once once the glass frogs are laid in a stream um, you know they're they're kind of going their own way and doing their own thing whereas these dart frogs have to kind of pit it out against each other in a pond or a small body of water um, so we did see kind of a correlation like that. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to do with the research, but I'm just wondering, since these are not local or even native species, like where did you get the tadpoles or um, I guess like did you have breeding pairs of frogs? Like how did, how did you get acquire them? Right. So the so there are established pair breeding pairs in the lab. Um, they came from different sources. Um, I think so, some came from other labs. Some came from ordering from frog distributors. Um, but the tadpoles that I work with were all born in the lab. Um, they were all yeah from breeding parents that were already established there um, so i did actually get to see a lot of like the glass frogs go from tadpoles on leaves to dropping into a body of water and then moving them into their tadpole tank and i even got to see um, some of the uh, like the dart frogs the parents i would see like the eggs and then see them move the tadpoles to the body of water and then um, we would put them in a cup and so yeah they were all from the lab but i got to see it from like the beginning to their later stages How did the poison dart frog have its poison? So the poison dart frogs are poisonous in the wild because of what they eat. They eat a specific type of insect that gives them the ability to harness that as a weapon and then they can secrete that to prevent predators from eating them. But in the lab they just eat flies so they don't get that, they don't get the necessary uh, ability that they need to produce the poison. So they're not poisonous. Same question. 
we'll take we'll take one more and then we'll move on and then we'll have the question time at the end so my question is uh, do you think uh, the nature has a, um, like a coalition why there's more neural mass on the glass frog because the other the other one is being like they are dependent on their parents mm. to survive so they have lesser neural mass we don't know that for sure but that's kind of a guess um, I'd say that's something that we talked about in the lab um, there would need to be more research looked into it but I think that was kind of the conclusion that we were coming to um, that because the uh, glass frogs rely so heavily on water to survive less than their parents um, that they might have the more of these sensory organs to help them survive because they don't have their parents they're helping them so over time we believe that you know they may have developed this in order to in order to sur to survive better their species all right let's thank sarah again and give stephanie a chance So we're going to wind down with a bit of microbiology and talk of brassica. So uh, here we go. You know what? I'm going to go on this side. Okay. So my name is Stephanie and I was paired up with Dr. Michael Miller's lab this summer and um, was also paired up with my mentor, Jashwan Lee. And uh, I'm going to talk about the bacterial metabolism of glucosinolates from Brassica association with isothiocyanates. A bit of disclaimer here, I am not a clinical or registered dietitian nor a nutritional therapist and cannot legally advise you on your daily diet protocol. I do like to follow the law sometimes, so keep that in mind. Alrighty, I know you guys must be thinking, your title makes no sense. What does it mean? So let me break it down a bit here. Okay, so glucosinolates or GSLs, oh, what am I doing here? Okay, are chemical compounds or molecules found in brassica vegetables such as kale or broccoli at high concentrations. GSLs can be broken further down or metabolized into a variety of components, a couple which are beneficial to humans. So uh, the different components or products altogether or included are isothiocyanates or ITCs. They're believed to be the most beneficial and desirable component, amines, desulfo GSLs, which can be used as a sugar source for energy, and nitriles. All right, let's dig a little deeper into those ITCs since they're the most believed to be most desirable and beneficial. So they can have anti-carcinogenic, anti-inflammatory, uh, oxidation regulation, neuroprotection, and anti-obesity properties. Um, GSL conversion to IC ITC by the human gut microbiota ranges from about one to over 40%, uh, so huge variance. Uh, the GSL to ITC conversion pathway is extensively researched, but there's little research on the alternative metabolic pathways. So metabolism is when a living organism uh, breaks down the food it intakes and utilizes, uptakes, and or discards nutrients from the food. Uh, there can be several different ways or paths, pathways to metabolize various nutrients. Let's talk about bacteria. Bacteria is everywhere. This is normal and it's okay. So there are beneficial bacteria and pathogenic bacteria that can make you sick. Oh, I'm just throwing this thing around, okay. Uh, we have a variety of bacteria in our own guts that can be referred to as the gut microbiome or the gut microbiota, and they help with our everyday living and digestion. And guess what? Bacteria can metabolize too. So there are bacteria present on the surface of brassica vegetables, uh, which metabolize the GSLs into the products previously mentioned. Eating brassica vegetables with GSL metabolizing bacteria on the surface could potentially change our gut microbiomes. So say you eat the vegetable, the bacteria is on the vegetable, 
it could potentially, you know, stay in your gut, make a home, change your gut microbiome. If the bacteria utilize the alternative metabolic pathways, which result in the production of the sulfogeous cells or the nitriles, this could provide some explanation as to why there's a high variance in human gut microbial GSL to ITC conversion. So what did I do all summer, you might be wondering. I explored the alternative metabolic pathways of GS cells and bacteria present on the surface of Brassica vegetables. Uh, here's that pointer. Um, yeah, so I wanna break down this chart a bit for you guys and kind of go through it. So here we have the glucosinolate or the GS cell. And here's the pathway um, to producing the ITCs. And something I want you to take note of here is you can also get some nitriles um, through this pathway, uh, gesundheit. And then for the alternative pathways, you can get desulfo-GSL uh, with the help of this protein enzyme called sulfatase. And then uh, you can get the nitrile uh, with this protein enzyme uh, called thioglucosidase. So something to keep in the back of your mind for a minute. So how was this done? So uh, my mentor, Joshua, and I, we handpicked the fresh kale and uh, lettuce. Uh, we had the lettuce as a control to compare against. Um, from the UI, UC Student Self-Sustainable Farm. Beautiful place. It was a beautiful day. If you guys can ever make it out there, I highly recommend it. And there are wonderful folks out there. So we made juice from each vegetable, pretty much. Grew the bacteria in different environments and gave them different food sources. And then we analyzed the activity of their enzymes to tell us which metabolic pathways were being utilized. So what was revealed? So eight GSL enriched strains uh, tested positive for sulfatase and thioglucosidase. So if you think back to that chart, so if any of them were positive just for the thioglucosidase, that doesn't really mean much. That means it probably took the ITC route. Um, but being positive for both the sulfatase and thioglucosidase can kind of tell us, oh, it went the alternative way. Because that chart, that's just a proposed, oh, these could be the pathways not fully confirmed. And by the way, the idea between those pathways is that they're all happening at the same time. So it's sort of a competition. So seven of the enriched kale and lettuce strains, um, seven of the eight, were identified to be the Enterococcus caseliflavus. Uh, the next steps um, in this research would be to confirm the sulfatase, thioglucosidase, and ITC production. And by doing this, we can quantify the amount of products produced from the pathways, and that can give us an idea of the competition going on there. So final thoughts, one of the pathways um, being utilized, or once the pathways are being utilized, um, are confirmed and quantified, we can use the 16S RNA sequencing to get a firm identity on those strains and the genes involved, and that can help us study the processes um, in more detail. Um, another step could be performing an animal study, feed the subjects a diet of kale and lettuce, uh, then use similar analysis procedures on their gut microbiome. Acknowledgements, um, I would like to thank the NSF um, for funding, uh, UIUC and Parkland College, and of course, um, program PIs, Dr. Schroeder and Dr. Carlson, and Dr. Michael Miller, uh, my mentor, Joshua Lee, and Anshi Zao, kind of like another mentor. Uh, Mark Peterson, he was a vet med student I worked with as well in that same lab. Uh, Matt Torino of the Illinois Student Sustainable Farm and the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory, uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. So we're a little short on time, but I think we can take one, maybe two. Um, I, I was wondering what happens when something gets metabolized? Okay, yeah. Um, so 
all living things metabolize um, when we like when we're eating so we're eating food we metabolize that food um, and when we metabolize it uh, our body is like taking the substances from the food that it needs it doesn't need all of the substances necessarily so some of them just get discarded and you know um, but yeah that's did, did that answer your question all right cool Maybe one more. Okay, so my question is about if we let this bacteria, if we eat a lot of that and you get um, a lot of that bacteria in your microbiome, yes. Um, so you said it, it could change it. So mm -hmm. um, is there anything to let us know if that change is to, like preferable for us or is, that, is it invasive and we're kind of worried about it? Um, do you know, did you get that far? Well, the idea is, um, so that bacteria could potentially be um, the reason for that high GSL to ITC conversion in the human gut. So that was like a one to a 40% conversion like in this clinical study. Um, and, you know, it depends. So quantifying the pathways, we can get an idea of that competition. And if we're eating vegetables with that bacteria on it, who use the alternative pathways. Um, I mean, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's toxic, but I, you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of where the study went. The idea is that we want to be producing more of those ITCs because, you know, they had those, all those good properties. Um, when I was chatting with Dr. Miller one day, um, those chats were always fun. Going for a couple minutes turns into an hour, great conversations. Um, but I was kind of like, oh, if we figure out what genes are involved, could we potentially like block the genes that are like going for the alternative pathways and, and so we can just produce those ITCs? Um, I think that would be cool if that could be done, but he kind of looked at me like, you're going a little too far. <laughs> we're, we're not there yet. So um, I, ITCs can be toxic, but um, it has to be a huge quantity. Eating eating vegetables or vegetables with the bacteria on it, I don't think is going to be toxic. For sure. So let's thank Stephanie one more time. <laughs> and then because of time, I know we said that we'd have a panel, but we're pretty much all out of time because we had some awesome presentations and great questions from you guys. So. If we could just have the speakers come up here again so that you guys can all get a round of applause. And if we have questions, we'll be out in the lobby so we can talk to you guys. Thank you.